said the the Reverend Charles Chinequoy against slander charge in Springfield. Chinequoy was the most controversial Catholic priest of the era. He vigorously defended his church, even to the point of slandering his critics. He later converted to be a Presbyterian and uh, began to uh, slander the Catholic Church. <laughs> After Lincoln's assassination, Chinequoy claimed Lincoln shared religious confidences with him that even his most intimate friends of Lincoln have never heard. Uh, Chinequoy also claimed that he warned Lincoln that the Jesuits would revenge themselves on him for defending Chinequoy. After the assassination, millions of Americans believed the priest allegations that Lincoln's assassination was a Catholic plot, all because Lincoln had defended Chinequoy in 1856. Wow. In, 18, in 1860, Lincoln wrote back uh, to his roommate as a congressman, Ohio Representative Joshua Giddings, who had written to congratulate Lincoln on, as a presidential candidate. Giddings predicted that Lincoln would succeed as long as he avoided, quote, corrupting influences, close quote. Lincoln replied, I am not wanting in purpose, though I may fail in the strength to maintain my freedom from bad influences. Your letter comes to my aid at this point most opportunely. Uh, may the Almighty grant that the cause of truth, justice, and humanity shall in no wise suffer in my hands. Finally, in 1862, almost as if to emphasize how fraught was the current status of Union command, Lincoln wrote to General McClellan, confirming that if his army should join with McDowell's in Virginia, McClellan would be in command, except that no order could put McDowell out of position to cover Washington. So clearly no trust between McClellan and Lincoln uh, in 1862. And that's what Lincoln was doing today, May 21. Thank you, David, back to you. Thanks, John. and. Uh... John Willen, I will, I'll go ahead. I wasn't sure if you're going to be here. So I'll go ahead and introduce Nancy. Um, so I, I actually first met Nancy Spanos at the Mollus uh, dinner a year plus ago uh, when I was a speaker and then she was a speaker this past uh, uh, February. Um, Nancy uh, got a bachelor's degree from Bryn Mawr College and then a, a, a bachelor's degree from Bryn Mawr and a master's from Columbia University and enjoyed a very long career in political journalism. She started studying Alexander Hamilton in the mid 1970s and co-edited the book of writings on the economics of the American Revolution, which major excerpts from Hamilton's financial papers were featured. Uh, her most recent book, uh, Defeating Slavery, Hamilton's American System Showed the Way, lays out the blueprint for Abraham Lincoln's own philosophy and argues that the failure to end slavery was the abandonment of Hamilton's economic principles. And so we'll examine how Jeffersonians and Jacksonians uh, promoted slavery uh, and put the nation on a path to war, as well as how Lincoln guided the return to Hamiltonian principles uh, leading up to and during the war. This is history that's relevant to today's political situation, as most of you probably understand. And, uh, and Nancy helps show a pathway to resolving our crisis today. So she continues educating the public on Hamilton's American system through her blog, americansystemnow.com. And as an adjunct professor at Frederick uh, Community College in Frederick, Maryland. And with that, please welcome Nancy Spanos and you should be able to share your, uh, your screen with your PowerPoint. Okay, hi. Um, I've, I've been doing a lot. This is my third event today. <laughs> uh, all my events this month happened to fall on today. Um, and uh, last time I did it, the screen showed you the advance slide. If that's the case, I really don't have the technical capability of changing it. So I hope you don't mind. <laughs> um, let's see. So, 
Do you see that? Do you see that screen? Yes. Yes, you do. Okay. Yes, I can and see you probably that. also see that thing on the right, but I don't know how to deal with it. So please can you share me. your screen. I mean, uh, run the slideshow. Because we can see the slides on the side as well. I know. I don't you know. Can't how do it. To, I don't okay. know how to get rid of it. So, oh, so Nancy, this is Kelsey. Yeah. If you just hit that um, right where your cursor is, if you just go a little bit up in that left hand corner and it says from beginning, that will start it big screen for you. And it'll fill the whole screen. So do you see where your cursor is? You know, I have two computers. Oh, okay. just, just share the from beginning at the very top. Click I, on did that. That. I did that. I did that. Oh, I did that. And on just, one screen, I have. Just you know, go ahead and give your presentation. I think I might as well just go ahead because it's, yeah. uh, it's That's not good. clear that I'll be able to correct it because it has something to do with the fact that I'm sharing two screens. <laughs> Maybe if I take the other screen out, uh, it would work. Let's let's check that. That that would be a very simple thing to do. Nope, still that way. So you can hear me fine though, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, and that's good. We can see just the slide you're talking about. So that's good. Okay. So um I'm not sure I'm gonna live up totally to what David said because I'm not gonna I don't really have planned to talk too much about Jackson and Jefferson but we can certainly discuss that um, and in the course of things. Um, I, I struggle to keep these presentations uh, not too long. <laughs> um, so uh, we'll see what uh, we can do here. So I've entitled it Lincoln's Debt to Hamilton. Um, this is over the course of Looking at Hamilton's legacy, it became clear that Lincoln was the preeminent Hamiltonian in the presidency following his uh, following uh, Hamilton's demise and the apparent demise of his ideas influencing government. But uh, I've come to really be very attached to Lincoln. I guess I always was. Um, but uh, and therefore have concentrated a lot more on that. So, but I wanna, I have to give you essential background on the connection. Uh, the, my view is similar to that of some other Hamilton historians, which is that as president, Hamilton did what Lincoln I mean, Lincoln did what Hamilton had planned and imagined for the country. And that includes the fact that it includes the program of industrialization, uh, which it can be summarized as the American system, uh, which I will go into. And it includes the demise of slavery, hopefully in a, through a peaceful means. Uh, over a period of time. So um, that's part of where uh, my ideas uh, lie. And these are the key tenets of the American system of economics as I've outlined. I do have a previous book to the, the current one entitled uh, Hamilton versus Wall Street, the core principles of the American uh, system of economics. And this, these are taken from my reading of that document and how Hamilton put them into action. And I think you can see how uh, they cohere with concepts that Lincoln put into to action. Uh, very strong emphasis on supporting public credit and using public credit uh, that is national funding for to back economic growth, including infrastructure, the national sovereignty over your currency, uh, in particular, um, the government protection for labor and crucial industry, and economic independence and national unity, which 
comes under the concept of the general welfare in the Constitution, which, as you know, is the one element from the preamble which exists twice uh, in the Constitution as a commitment to the nation of, for the nation. So to, be, to get us a bridge, right, of to go into Lincoln's own activity, uh, that coming a wee bit later uh, than the, the founding of the country, um, I want to start with the Hamiltonian economic establishment uh, in that time. So there are two basic premises uh, that I espouse uh, that characterize this early period. This first is that the founding documents of the United States do not enshrine slavery, and in fact, were based on the idea it would be dying out. Uh, this is an idea I know all of you Lincoln scholars are aware that uh, Lincoln espoused, but it also was uh, a major <clears throat> um, element of my own uh, reading of those documents. And the second is that industrialization, with its concomitant upgrading of labor, uh, an investment in the conditions of life of labor was required in order to eliminate the slave system. Uh, as I put it in the introduction to the book, uh, a moral approach to human beings required a moral economics. And it was, there was nothing moral about uh, maintaining the slave system. So that was treating, in fact, man as an animal. So a uh, hardworking uh, animal. So uh, those are two basic premises that we start with. And as you know, uh, you know, Lincoln's view, I believe, is most succinctly and effectively uh, represented with this speech from the Dred, on his Dred Scott decision as to what the declaration actually uh, meant with all men are created equal. Um, this I use this all the time. Um, obviously, it flies in the face, as was referenced before, to the some of a lot of the popular opinion that is now thrown around around the Declaration of Independence. But I think it's absolutely critical to uh, our identity as a nation, since with the Declaration having been the actual founding document of the United States of America. And then on the view of the Constitution, um, I look for something he said in specific about that. Of course, there's a lot, you know, particularly as we're coming into the, the secession and his commitment to maintaining the Constitution and its uh, perpetual nature and uh, integrity, uh, not being able to be subjected to secession. Uh, but I think that this in particular um, also, I, I'm not sure I identified this the right place. This may be actually also in the Dred Scott decision, but um, that he makes it very, he references this fact that's uh, enshrined in an art in the book by Sean Willens, uh, No Property in Man, that there is nothing in the Constitution uh, that actually distinctly affirms this as a as a protected institution, uh, much less a desirable institution uh, that should be spread. Um, and as I guess it was James Oakes who writes, and Willens also, that slavery was intended as, and was tolerated as a local institution, but not as uh, enshrined in the Constitution. And that, of course, also coheres with Frederick Douglass's view, 
which this is a quote from him in 1860 from his speech in Scotland, where he is defending the constitution against the Garrisonites who are mobilizing there. But uh, it was his not his view at the very beginning when he was working with Garrison, but by 1850, uh, he had changed his view. Uh, actually, by the time of that famous speech on the declaration, which Douglas makes, uh, he asserts this view that the constitution does not guarantee the right for any man to hold another man in slavery. So we're dealing, I think, looked at correctly, our founding, do our founding uh, documents do not enshrine slavery, but we had to deal with the fact that it existed coming into its, uh, the establishment of the Constitution of the United States. But in the compromise that was carried out there in order to make to which represented a commitment to maintaining the unity of all the colonies as the first priority in order to establish the basis to be able to create a more perfect union, the uh, certain uh, the compromise was made. The, the concentration on the on the union is actually another common characteristic, I think, of Lincoln and Hamilton, uh, because he was very much he and Washington, of course, were very much uh, concerned with maintaining the unity and of all the states, and convinced that actually the it was the desire for power and maintaining control in the states uh, that represented a major threat to that unity. In addition to, I would add, to the empires that still surrounded us uh, and were dominant in the world. Um, there were powers in the Constitution that could be used to ultimately destroy slavery. Uh, the federal power over the territories, uh, the Commerce Clause, um, the commitment to the general welfare, uh, which was actually cited in um, by, I believe, by to adopting the Constitution at the ratification um, convention in Virginia, where he said, well, you know, if they're talking about the general welfare, they could decide that it's against the general welfare to have slavery. Uh, and that would be really, uh, that would destroy our ability to, as he put it, although it was even sanitized at the time, keep our niggers, right? Um, they even sanitized that in the press uh, from a very early age. Um, and then the privileges and immunities clause, which is the clause that I think it's Article Four, uh, that Hamilton considered one of the most important clauses in the Constitution. Hamilton having been a major force in shaping the Constitution, both from, you know, from calling the convention uh, to being on the committee of the final committee on style, which amazingly enough, I mean, given that you're you're given to believe that he was an outlier with his major speech on the powers of the federal government. Uh, you know, he was elected unanimously to be on the Committee of Style to do the final draft of the Constitution. What he considered the Privileges and Immunities Clause uh, critical because that's the one that guarantees the rights of uh, a citizen in any state to be upheld by those in other states. Um, and so in some, you know, slavery was considered a local institution, freedom national. Now, there has also been a lot of noise over the last period, I guess two, three years now, um, started by a docent at the Schuyler House uh, in uh, New, York, New York State, uh, Hamilton's father-in-law to say that, uh, well, Hamilton was an enslaver and he wasn't really against slavery as, as most biographers have said and famously as 
portrayed in the musical and Chernow's biography and others have always said that he was the most anti-slavery and of all the central founding fathers. Um, but this is as indicated in my book and also uh, by a very thorough research job on a site called Discovering Hamilton. Uh, it's based on, you know, shoddy research, speculation, and prejudice, basically. Uh, the woman says, well, he saw all these rich people in the in the uh, Caribbean be having a good life by having slaves, so he must have, since he wanted to become a prominent, successful person, he must have wanted to do that, too. I mean, it's, that's the most ludicrous of all of them. But he did, uh, it's important for his economic argument to know that he was personally opposed to slavery as well. Uh, this is his first comment, um, which very early in his revolutionary career, actually the earliest writing of his, that we can actually successfully identify, there may have been a couple earlier than that, um, that where he is attacked, he's connecting the horror, the immorality of slavery to the act to uh, its effect on industry and its effect on economy, which is an important connection given where he's going in terms of his work as the shaper of our economic system, our political economy. Um, then the the second thing he does in the uh, that gives power to the federal more power to the federal government uh, that uh, then and therefore potentially creates uh, the power to move in the direction of ending slavery is his consolidation of all the war debts. Uh, and this was done through the first report on public credit. Um, and it was opposed, and it that meant that the federal government had access to, had a lot of power, uh, was able to use that debt as credit through government bonds and uh, be more determinant in the economy of the country. Uh, and as I indicated before with Patrick Henry on the question of the general welfare, it was opposed in part uh, by those who wanted to, uh, who were afraid that that power would be used in order to interfere with the slave system, even more so the First Bank of the United States, uh, uh, the, where that debt consolidation, which Hamilton carried out, was actually uh, put into action. The debt was repurposed, as some people uh, put it today, uh, through those government bonds to capitalize the, the probably the fourth bank in the United States, a $10 million institution, Three quarters of the capital had to be paid in treasury bonds, uh, which obviously supported the treasury bonds, but also uh, provided a, a capital baseline. This was a commercial bank uh, with the power to lend to industry and agriculture and commerce. Uh, and it was in particular uh, heavily opposed by the, by Thomas Jefferson, to, to tell the to tell the truth, um, Jefferson, there's a letter from Jefferson in 1791 to Madison who said that anyone in Virginia who's collaborating with the National Bank uh, should actually be uh, brought up for treason and uh, executed. Um, so some people say that must have been a joke. Uh, especially since apparently Jefferson himself had bought shares in the bank. But uh, but he was just incredibly hostile to it 
both because of the power it represented in the economy and because he knew that the way Hamilton would want to use that power would be to, industri to bring industrialization. And industrialization uh, would mean <clears throat> the destruction of the slave system. And that industrialization uh, campaign of Hamilton's uh, is reflected in a couple ways. The first way was the establishment of this Society for Useful Manufactures in Northern New Jersey. Um, this is the Passaic Falls, uh, which was the power source of the society uh, envisioned as such. This picture is from the early 20th century and that electric plant right there, which is run by the water power of the falls, still operates to provide electricity to about a third of the homes in the city of Patterson uh, when the water is pouring well, you know, when we're not in a drought. But um, this was the power source that uh, Hamilton, it was the most powerful water source in the entire country because Niagara was still under control of the British and was intended to establish an industrial, basically an industrial park, uh, which would uh, allow uh, the development of a whole array of industries uh, to be uh, uh, established, supported, um, and to create a situation where we are producing on our own and don't have to import everything uh, from abroad. The second major element, which has lasted through the ages, was Hamilton's report on manufacturers, which was uh, submitted a little bit before the uh, establishment of the uh, of the uh, SEUM, at approximately the same time. Uh, and this is the document where you find most of the development of his economic thinking. Uh, it has a, theor a lot of theoretical discussion of what creates wealth. Uh, it has a, effectively the results of a two-year economic survey of what was being produced in the United States, where, you know, linens, uh, um, what do you call it, hides, uh, clothing, and so forth and iron, most importantly, actually number one, and then a whole series of proposals you know, on about 14 different areas of what should be done um, in order to ensure that we are producing uh, the necessities and are not dependent upon, that we have economic independence uh, as well as political independence. Um, and all of those there's no in, no discussion of slavery here. There's no discussion of tobacco or, you know, there is discussion of clothing. Uh, it's silent on those questions, but it is a, a thrust to government support for developing manufacturers that need to be done through the National Bank. Um, the, my book, Hamilton versus Wall Street, has a couple full chapters on this. Um, and it's integral, obviously, to the question of the uh, book on uh, slavery, because following the demise of the report on the, on the initial Bank of the United States, a second Bank of the United States is established on the same principle, even larger, and was very effectively used to subsidize federal government participation with local uh, municipalities, states, companies uh, to begin to build national infrastructure, to begin to, uh, to support develop, you know, advancing technological breakthroughs in industry and so forth. Uh, so this was moving us really strongly in that direction. Uh, in the what produces national wealth, this is very critical to this question of slavery. Uh, he, you know, he debunks the idea that it's 
the physiocratic idea uh, that wealth all comes from agriculture. Um, and Adam Smith does that too. Uh, but he also debunks the idea that it just comes from uh, advantage in trading, uh, you know, buying cheap, selling dear. Uh, where it comes from is mechanization and develop and in which leads you to technological progress, which comes from scientific breakthroughs leading to to uh, technological progress. And this is just a couple of pictures of the people from that time. James Rumsey, I'm sure uh, David is quite familiar with these people. Uh, these are both uh, individuals involved in the development of steam power, Rumsey being having been promoted and <clears throat> uh, probably financed by George Washington uh, way in Shepherdstown, or I guess it was then Mecklenburg, uh, Virginia, uh, not far from where I live right now. So um, Hamilton doesn't talk about these people, but what he talks about is the necessity for mechanization uh, and when some people object, and he goes through the series of objections to manufacturing, saying, "Our well, we're paying our workers much more than they do in Europe, and we don't want to pay, you know, uh, therefore we can't afford to do this. He says, well, that's, uh, we can afford to continue to pay our workers more. All we have to do is mechanize and make uh, the, the uh, production more um, productive. Um, and in the course of developing the advantages of manufacturing, uh, of which there are numerous, uh, I was particularly struck when I first read this document, which was way back in about uh, 1975, um, with this argument um, that manufacturing was a way, a means of cherishing and stimulating the activity of the human mind. That obviously to closely connected with this idea of technological breakthroughs that are required for the economy as a whole, but also so different from what you get in Economics 101 or other kinds of reviews of what economic planning and, and economic thinking is all about. Uh, he was thinking in a way that really took the cultural and uh, human aspect of what was required for development of a nation into account, the activity of the human mind. And these principles, you know, were, are the antithesis of those that were behind slavery. Uh, the slaveocracy was determined that there not be uh, support from the government for manufacturing. Uh, Jefferson was uh, wrote memos uh, attacking the report on manufacturers, like, let our let our workshops remain in Europe. Uh, manufacturing is dirty, et cetera, et cetera. Um, manufacturing advances the productive powers of labor, uh, especially through mechanization. The South was the slave slave dominated South was. I don't want to attack everybody in the South because this was a basically a controlled environment by powerful forces who were tied to the slave trade. But the um, so call it slaveocracy. Uh, you know, we're, we're not investing in the most advanced technological developments for to improve their farming. They were running labor gangs, right? They were, it was human power. It was, it was treating human beings as beasts, just the opposite of the development of mechanization. Uh, the, the diverse, that kind of diversity depends on advancing the power of the human mind. And uh, they opposed even having people get be educated, the uh, enslaved working population uh, to be educated. They opposed the investment in infrastructure on the scale that 
Hamilton was proposing and that uh, the federal government alone could actually carry out through uh, its credit capabilities. Uh, the regulation of standards, which Hamilton proposed, uh, and subsidization, literally, of new technologies. Uh, these were uh, absolutely opposed uh, and because they undercut the basis for slavery, which was treating human beings as beasts. Uh, so the beginnings of the industrialization under uh, Hamilton uh, were a start uh, first factories, uh, infrastructure projects where the major infrastructure project was the lighthouses, completing a whole series of lighthouses, which were ordered to be uh, ceded from the states to the federal government. Uh, this one on the right is in Portland, Maine, which is my hometown. So I like that one, but it was completed under Hamilton. And there's one in Virginia, uh, uh, Fort, at Fort Henry, which was called Hamilton's Light uh, because the federal government invested in this as a major support for, and it was free, right? No tolls. You know, if you had an accident, you needed the people in the lighthouse to come help you. Um, you didn't have to pay for the ambulance, so to speak, <laughs> uh, the way uh, uh, tends to happen now. So the beginnings were carried out. The, the credit uh, system was set up uh, as a potential, um, and then uh, it was effectively sabotaged over the next uh, 20 years um, when the uh, Jeffersonians came into power. You know, he opposed the National Bank to report on manufacturers. He wanted the manufacturers to remain cut government expenditures, including to infrastructure. His idea of slavery was let's diffuse it throughout the country and then it won't be, you know, then we won't have these masses of slaves who might carry out a revolt, but you also would not eliminate slavery. In fact, the, the Louisiana story is a, a, a tragic one, but uh, I won't go into that right now. And uh, one symbolic element of this, which I find very uh, telling was that one of the first things he did was cut off support for the Haitian revolutionaries, uh, which uh, the Adams administration, with the collaboration of Hamilton, was actually carrying out. Uh, so how did Hamilton's policies survive? How did we actually get them up to Lincoln? Well, they came through this family uh, it's supposed to be Matthew Carey and Henry Carey, um, but Henry Clay played a role too. So um, so this guy, Matthew Carey, was uh, emigre, uh, one of Franklin's finds in Europe, uh, people he sent here. And he, although a Jeffersonian, uh, began propagandizing for Hamilton's national banking and support for manufacturers in the 1790s uh, in opposition to the Jeffersonian view. Um, his first major political battle was the attempt to, uh, re to save the First Bank of the United States, saying this would there would be an economic disaster uh, and therefore potentially a military disaster if that uh, source of finance for the federal government was eliminated. Um, he was not successful. Um, and he, uh, but we squeaked through <laughs> uh, the War of 1812. And, but after, but by that time, by the end of the war, everyone knew he was right. You know, this was devastating. The government uh, was bankrupt again, unable to pay its debts. Uh, there had been a tremendous difficulty moving the troops and supplying the troops, uh, and we were paying through the nose in order to borrow money. Uh, borrow money. The states had to issue their own money and so forth. So 
you know, Carrie said, um, let's re let's evaluate what went wrong and figure out what to do about it. Wrote this pamphlet um, called the uh, Olive Branch, which was next to Common Sense, one of the most popular pamphlets in the United States. Many people don't know about this today. In fact, they don't know about Matthew Carey. Uh, he's calling, he's saying both sides are really responsible for the fact we had a disaster. On the one hand, you had these traitors up there in uh, one faction of the Federalist Party who were so much against the war, they were actually siding with the British because it cut into their trading income. And uh, But we can't forget that on the other side, the, Dem the Jeffersonians and Democratic Republicans didn't, uh, you know, failed economically. They killed the Bank of the United States. They stripped our defenses because they didn't want to spend any money. Uh, and he promoted a return to Hamilton's principles in name. This, he said, this is the political economy that promotes human happiness. It's the most noble subject. Hard for you to think, you know, about that. Uh, but sorry about that. Um, but uh, you have to have industry and technological progress for your, uh, uh, in order to create a successful state. And he reprints whole sections of the report on manufacturers. This is in 1819, early 1820s. So we're now into a period where Lincoln is 11 years old. I, I can't say that he read this in particular, uh, but we'll catch up with what he did. Uh, and then this, uh, but what's developing here is what, Ham what Lincoln did pick up. Uh, what's developing is by name, the American system, which is championed by Henry Clay and John Quincy Adams. Um, and with the organizing support of Matthew Carey and a whole section of the National Republicans. Uh, at a very late age, late, late state, James Monroe breaks with the Jeffersonian uh, tradition and adopts that as well. And we begin to have movement toward uh, support for industrialization. As you know, uh, John Quincy Adams was probably our, before Lincoln, our most anti-slavery president, and he moved in certain ways uh, against that. But it, industry was the major thing. So at this point, Lincoln enters, and I've taken a long time getting up to him, but um, this is the part you're probably much more familiar with. Um, he's waging campaigns for Hamilton's policies from the very beginning, uh, campaigning for the National Bank, the famous quote, of his from his initial campaign, uh, you know, is directly in contrast to what Jackson is doing in dismantling the American system, um, and is effectively a support for what Hamilton had laid out in the report on manufacturers: support for internal improvements, uh, tariffs to protect industry, uh, and national banking. Now, the result of Jackson's eliminating the national bank, uh, and that introduced a whole period of wildcat banking. Um, it coincided with international economic uh, developments that were uh, threatened US trade and so forth. And we ended up having uh, a panic in 18, a lot of speculation of panic in 1837, and then a long-lasting depression. Um, the so that effectively helped reinforce the idea that we needed to go back to, or at least adopt a different economic approach than the one that had led to this. Um, and the hope was that the Whig Party, which had been formed in opposition to Jackson, would actually adopt that approach uh, by establishing a new national bank uh, and supporting infrastructure 
from the federal government and reinstating the tariff for it to defend industry. So that's the Harrison campaign. Um, and it you know, played a populist game in the sense of not playing up the economic, its economic policies. Uh, but Lincoln did the opposite. Lincoln went out and gave speeches to on reestablishing the National Bank. Um, in, in fact, the Whig Party was so impressed with that that they uh, issued a pamphlet that uh, and circulated it on one of the speeches that Lincoln gave, uh, where he was attacking the Democratic Party's plan for what to do on the economy and supporting the establishment of a new national bank. That nas new national bank was passed by the new Congress. The Whigs did uh, win a victory in that election. Uh, but as you know, Harrison died very soon uh, afterwards and uh, Tyler uh, basically uh, killed it. Uh, by going back and and uh, and saying it was unconstitutional, despite rulings of the Supreme Court and activity. Second element, so that indicates that Hamilton was, I mean, that Lincoln was uh, very much attuned to that aspect of the policy, of Hamiltonian policy. Um, this is intensified by his study of Henry C. Carey. Henry C. Carey is the son of Matthew Carey. Uh, he's a political scientist, economist, uh, and he has done voluminous studies about various countries' economic development, what leads to development, what leads to destruction, and what leads to slavery. Uh, and what we know from numerous biographers uh, and Lincoln himself is that he that Lincoln embarked on a whole study of economics, and that Carey was one of the individuals that he was most in tune with uh, in that study. So Carey is to play an extremely important role as a transmission belt of Hamiltonian ideas to Lincoln, uh, both in his studies and also in direct collaboration. Carey's core concepts uh, are encapsulated in this uh, very popular book, Harmony of Interest, where he argues contrary to Marx and others that agriculture, manufacturers, and commerce, you know, can complement each other uh, and carry out mutual prosperity if we organize our economy in the correct way. Uh, and that all of that involves what he called raising the value of man, which means investing in improving your infrastructure, in education, in uh, ensuring that you're developing your industry uh, and creating civilization. Uh, he's looking at you know what might be called cultural issues uh, for the up for the improvement of the human mind. <laughs> Uh, echoes of Hamilton at that point. Um, and, you know, he's convinced, as I believe that Lincoln was as well, uh, that that kind of prosperous economy is based on a concept of human identity, uh, where man is not just an animal uh, that has to work under pressure. Uh, man is a being made in the image of his creator uh, and that therefore uh, we have to run our economy on that basis of constant improvement, constant enrichment, not just physical, you know, well, gold enrichment, monetary enrichment, uh, but enrichment in the broadest sense. And as I said, I think those, that concept of man uh, can be found uh, and in the in the programs and the writings uh, to some extent in of Hamilton and Lincoln. Uh, now, when Lincoln goes to Congress, he continues uh, 
to reflect the fact that uh, he has adopted a Hamiltonian approach. Uh, you know, he's elected, uh, he's there when John Quincy Adams is there, who actually was carrying out that program a good number of decades before. Uh, he died, Quincy Adams dies in 48, Lincoln's there in 47. So there's a short period of time. Uh, maybe someone there know, of you knows more about any interchange, but uh, surely there was, there was such. Um, the, uh, again, we have a president who is antithetical to the American system. Uh, and when the Congress passes uh, an internal improvement bill, I believe the Whigs were uh, a majority in this Congress. Um, the, in 1847, uh, he vetoes it on the basis that the federal government shouldn't be involved in anything, in doing anything that just helps localities. And Lincoln takes this on. Uh, Lincoln goes uh, into, a ma get, makes a major speech and as well as numerous smaller speeches in Congress saying, uh, echoing arguments which were made by Alexander Hamilton, that if a physical, if, if an economic improvement, an internal improvement in a locality is part of a larger plan for improving your infrastructure, uh, Hamilton in particular talked about transportation, uh, then it is a legitimate basis for federal uh, economic support. And that's the argument that Lincoln made here about the Illinois and Michigan Canal. He said, okay, so it's all here in, uh, in Illinois, uh, but because of this, People in New York State can have a much more, uh, a much cheaper and more efficient way of getting their goods down to New Orleans, you know, uh, and vice versa. So this has national implications for improving the commerce, and therefore it should be eligible for federal aid. And Hamilton had made the same argument, as I said. And then you've got the presidency, which is sort of more obvious, I believe. Um, one of the elements going into that on how on the economy uh, as an element as a crucial element in eliminating slavery, again comes from Henry Carey, who is a leading economist on the in the Republican Party, organizing Republican Party conventions. Uh, in Pennsylvania, uh, helping Lincoln to win, <laughs> actually, the uh, nomination. But he wrote the major document in 1853 on the slave trade, domestic and foreign, and how it may be extinguished. And by that, he meant slavery itself as well. Uh, so that is uh, undoubtedly Lincoln had read that as well. And it is focused heavily on the need to invest in uh, and develop the South. Uh, that one of the problems is that the South tends to not be integrated uh, economically uh, with the Northern industrialization. Uh, we have to have a federal government committed to that national unity of economic development uh, connect the nation with infrastructure, uh, um, industrialize the South, and in the process, that will eliminate slavery. Uh, so Kerry is involved heavily in actually uh, drafting the National Republican platform. Uh, and as you know, there are considerable elements of Hamilton's program there. Uh, that improves, includes the infrastructure improvements in river and harbor, uh, the, the transcontinental railroad. Um, and as president, of course, these certain measures uh, are undertaken. Um, 
The first one, the moral tariff, as you know, happens right before Lincoln comes in, but he is heavily involved in supporting it. Uh, and that is an element of protecting industry as well as raising revenue. Uh, many people think of it as just raising revenue, but from the very beginning of the country, the tariffs were always seen as protecting and enhancing our manufacturing capability uh, just as much as, as raising revenue. Um, then you have the, the speech to Congress at the beginning of, of the December term, uh, which also emphasizes the economic element of trying to create conditions where the South can be uh, brought back into the Union. Uh, and uh, the, the railroad links uh, a priority on the interests of labor, which obviously goes against the slave system. Um, now, Lincoln was dealing with the results of having eliminated uh, the two banks of the United States. So, uh, he was in a free banking era, uh, which uh, was a doggy -e dog situation where the Wall Street banks were in primary control and the rest of the country was rather chaotic um, in terms of its credit system. This business records. The outcome likely to largely come down to whether jurors. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this was a problem. I mean, it was particularly a problem because the uh, Wall Street banks were not with the program, so to speak, of uh, Hamilton's, uh, of Lincoln's uh, thrust to support the industrial development that, had, that was required and uh, to fund the war in a way that wasn't going to uh, increase the bankruptcy of the country through usurious interest rates, wasn't going to strip us of our, all our gold, uh, which was tending to happen uh, in terms of selling the, when the bonds were sold to Europe. So, you know, we moved from there into uh, Lincoln's economic financial measures, uh, the Legal Tender Act, of, which creates the greenbacks. And you see here Hamilton on one of those uh, notes that's issued. Uh, the arguments for the Legal Tender Act and for the uh, subsequent Banking Act uh, were directly mustered from Hamilton's uh, reports by a New York congressman. Um, uh, and then Lincoln goes into what I think of as his New Deal, uh, but it also a, the kind of thing that would support the report on manufacturer's outlook. Uh, the the uh, Department of Agriculture, basically to provide the latest technology as well as credit for farmers to increase their productivity. The uh, Land Grant College Act, uh, all of which are using as Hamilton would support, uh, because he made the argument, Hamilton made the argument that the federal resources should be used liberally for questions of the general welfare. Uh, and that promotion of the general welfare, uh, Hamilton and Kerry, and as one of his advisors, was uh, intimately connected with the education and skill level of your workforce. Um, that, and that was one of the major concerns with the uh, Land Grant College Act, uh, which as you know, was again, heavily funded uh, through sales of federal government land. And then we have the National Currency Act establishing the national banking system, not a national bank, but similar to the national bank in the sense that the uh, national banks had to invest in U.S. Treasury bonds in order to get their currency. So in that sense, it linked the
the federal credit, uh, the federal debt structure, so to speak, uh, with your private sector credit system uh, in a way similar to what the National Bank did. Um, and then you have the National Transportation po uh, Grand Project, which was uh, the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, again, federal uh, monies required, federal uh, support bonds required in order to get that project done. It wouldn't have happened other than that. Uh, and again, the fact that that project paid off not only in productiv increase in productivity of the country and unity of the country, which was a major concern of Lincoln's as well, uh, to prevent the West and its mineral resources from being taken by the Confederacy, but also uh, was actually literally paid off uh, when the rail companies paid back uh, the bonds. And then, of course, Lincoln did, in my view, uh, fulfill what Hamilton would have wished to do um, to uh, by the ending of winning the war and ending slavery. Uh, and this is that famous, one of the famous photos of him doing his tour of Richmond uh, before his demise. So that's my story for the moment. Um, and these are my books. Uh, they're both available on Amazon. This one, the Defeating Slavery, is available in Kindle as well as the soft cover. Um, the Hamilton versus Wall Street is was not published by Amazon, but it is available there, uh, but also through its publisher, uh, Universe. And I would be pleased if uh, you would read them and get in touch with me. Uh, and I didn't make a final slide on how you can do that, but I can put it in the chat if you're interested. And thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. And yeah, put your contact information in, in the chat for people. And uh, if you could unshare your screen so we can get everybody up. I did try to do that. There you go. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, so that was a great talk. I really appreciate it. And one of the things that that you know we study Lincoln forget is that there was a whole lot of time before Lincoln that uh, Lincoln was basing things on. I mean, he was basing things on the Constitution and Declaration and Hamilton economics, uh, which was the major issue uh, leading up to that point. Uh, so, uh, basic rules: keep your keep your mic off unless uh, you're speaking, and either raise your hand using the uh, reactions, or if nobody's talking, you can open up your mic and ask a question. Uh, so we'll start with Debbie because she was the first one up with her hand up. So uh, Debbie, ask your question, and then we'll go to Ed Epstein after that. See who else is, ooh, is around. Ooh, ooh, pick me. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so thrilled with this uh, this presentation because you were there, uh, Professor, at the last book discussion of Pereno. And um, I, I will admit that was my question that I submitted about why Lincoln um, does not get the credit he deserves so many ways. Uh, in this case, for saving the country, doing the, the, the Greenback, the Tender Act. He was just uh, ahead of his time in all kinds of ways, ag again, financially. And so I was thrilled to see that that image of the Tender Act, of the green the green bag, realizing the significance that was in um, providing support, financial, uh, architectural financial support for the country. Did you have a sense of uh, the how magnanimous that was, how off the charts that was for him to to have revolutionized, um, uh, helped it, the, the finance situation. We know that he was following up on what had been built before, but he still took it, zoomed out into a whole different stratosphere in the country's 
uh, most turbulent, horrific time. Did you do you have any any comments on on um because uh, that you were there for that discussion on his his um insight, his ability, his vision to to take us to where no man had gone before, as in Star Trek. Uh, well, I what really struck me was that well, number one, Lincoln personally was committed to that policy of of uh, basing the credit uh, the the currency of the United States on the full faith and credit of the federal government, not on gold. He was personally committed to that. I mean, although you could say that he was being forced into it by necessity and so forth and so on. But what what has struck me is the the it, it was sort of a leap of faith, right? Because what did people really think about paper currencies, right? They thought, what's is it worth a continental, right? I mean, way back into the Revolutionary War. And it, the Revolutionary War was not all that far away to some people who uh, were alive at that time. But he succeeded in making it a patriotic issue of to accept this currency, and it was. Uh, and he wasn't above, I mean, there's something I just read the other day. Uh, he wasn't above arguing that those who were against it were basically against the union <laughs> because the, the greenbacks were being used to pay the troops. The greenbacks were being used to help the industries produce what was necessary in order to uh, wage the war. Uh, and if you start, uh, you know, if, if you undercut that, uh, what are you doing? Um, so uh, it's uh, it, it really was a bold move, right? Beyond what uh, what many would think uh, possible to be accepted, but but it was because the spirit of the country and his spirit of leadership made that made it possible. Mr. Epstein, thank you for. My wonderful presentation, Nancy. I was wondering, I always wonder this about Lincoln, and it, I think it's particularly pertinent to his view of how he came to be a, a Whig and a Hamiltonian economist. He was a guy who was, well, he's probably the poorest president ever when he was born. I mean, he was born in deep rural Kentucky. Not even, it wasn't even a log cabin. It was a, it was a hole in the ground, basically, that his father, you know, they to keep warm. How did this, he could have easily become a, a, a Democrat, a, a racist Democrat, uh, mistrustful of the powerful people, of capitalists, of industry. What do you think it was in his makeup, his character, that led Lincoln to become a, a Whig and a devotee of Hamiltonian economics? I think, I mean, I personally think it was the difference between his uh, his view of of human beings and their potential, right? Because I think that he I think he had an intuitive grasp of the fact that a system that that everybody needed to get support for improvement, right? Uh, and that was had to be material support as well as emotional support. You know, which he got from his mothers and so forth, but and that the only way that was possible was going to be through, uh, through using finance to create those conditions. Um, the other all the other alternative, he certainly saw plenty of the other alternative. I think uh, uh, he saw it when he went on his trip down to the south in. Uh, it, in 1828 and 1831, uh, you know, he saw a lot of support continuing in Illinois for for enslavement, um, and he uh, he rejected that whole idea of how you should treat human beings and what, how did human beings how were they able to progress? Then, uh, so I think he 
was revolted by the way human beings were treated under an anti-industrial system. I mean, um, and that led him to look for alternatives and the alternatives were available because there were economists that were writing about how we would uh, eliminate slavery with a uh, with investment in industrializing our economy that existed. And in fact, at one point, Henry Carey writes that if we had, if our, he says, if our legislation had been crafted at the beginning in such a way to fulfill the Declaration of Independence, we wouldn't have had the continuation of the slave system. The South would have been full of, you know, factories and towns and, you know, bustling activity, just like the North, and nobody would have been black and white. No one would have been enslaved. Uh, and I think, you know, that resonated with Lincoln. Um, I, that's all I can say. Okay, Bonnie, and, and then... I, think, I just want to add, I think, I think there's also the element that he was revolting against his father, Thomas, who was anti-education and thought his son was a, a layabout because he wanted to read books and things. And he, he was revolting against illiteracy and, uh, and the lack of books, the lack of reading, the lack of education. He himself only had how many, you know. Less than a year, people. they say. Of yeah. public, of, so he was uh, revolting against that, holding him back personally. Yeah, but I, I think that, yeah, but I think unlike, I mean, some people could take that just personally, right? And other people could extend it to the human race. And I think he, he is, his vision was much more universal uh, yeah. from the very beginning. Okay, uh, Bonnie and then Matt, I know, wants to ask a question and then Rod and then John Willen. So we got a, quite a long list here. <laughs> Go ahead, Bonnie. You need to, you're muted. Thank you very much for your interesting presentation. I didn't know that much about Hamilton, and I certainly appreciated learning about the vision that he had for our country. And so while I was listening, I it seemed to me that kind of ironic that secession may have facilitated Lincoln to be so proactive with, you know, the modernization and, the, you know, getting the, the bank and the agricultural department and all the modern things that he um, instituted during his presidency, that that may not, most of that or a lot of it wouldn't have happened if the South had not seceded because would they be against all of that modernization? Or was there popular um, opinion and desire for advancement enough that he could have gotten a, a lot of that, a lot of the Whig platform through? Do you understand what I'm asking? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I Someone else asked me that something similar, uh, another class, you know, what if what if there hadn't been a war, right? What if would he have been a great president? I mean, I think that's the way they put it. You know, did he? Well, he, he just did so much. He, you know, so many changes and advancements. Right. Yeah. I I think he was well. He was committed to that war or no war. Uh, in my view, uh, you know, there's a whole speech that he. You're probably all familiar. I know David is that. Uh, his Wisconsin Agricultural Society speech where he's talking about agriculture and he's saying to these farmers, he has the nerve to say, you know, you guys really aren't very productive. You think you're doing great, but, you know, uh, but I've looked at the figures and, you know, you could be producing this and you're only producing that much. And, you know, why don't you get the steam plow together by, after all, you know, what's the matter with you? Um, so, you know, he was looking to those kinds of improvements uh, from the very uh, from the very get go. Did the did the war, uh, the secession, allow him to do it 
in yeah. a way, I guess you could say yes, uh, because they uh, the the South seceded and the uh, you know opposition wasn't there uh, to vote against it, but the opposition was still there uh, in uh, as as we saw later. Um, so uh, it it's a situation where I think he would have had he would have maintained the same fight, but in a way, as it turned out, the uh, the war conditions allowed him to do stuff that might have taken longer to do or um you you just don't know uh it's it's hard to it's hard to say i mean there was popular support for having credit for example <laughs> um for uh, investment and in, among the farmers i mean after the destruction of the second national bank there were memorials that came in from all around the country from uh, groups in Michigan and other places saying, you know, you're you're killing us by killing our our credit support here. Uh, but it but it was not it didn't prevail, right? Uh, it didn't prevail sufficiently to uh, prevent an override of the veto. So, what would it have taken to succeed without the wartime conditions? You know, it, it's hard to say. I don't think there's a simple answer uh, to be said. Yeah, let's go to, to Matt. I know he had a question and then Rod and John Miller. It was a very stimulating talk. Uh, I have a question. Is it inevitable, is it correct to think that slavery and agriculture were inevitably tied together? Put it another way, was anyone in the North concerned that the South would start using slaves in manufacturing and perhaps have an advantage over, over the North. Because I remember when they came to Richmond, they found factories, if I'm right, that were making munitions and other things that were manned by slaves. So can't we imagine, do the two have to be inevitably joined? Couldn't you have a society, a Jeffersonian society, oddly enough, where dominated by manufacturing but having slavery. I don't think so. Uh, there, it's true that there were factories with that had slave labor, uh, but there was also tremendous resistance to that spreading very far because what the slave many members of the slaveocracy, not all of them, thought. Uh, realized is that when you sent uh, slave labor people to cities and they had interchange with other people who were not enslaved and they were, had, were exposed to a totally different kind of culture, uh, they tended to get what they would call uppity uh, and, you know, demand to be treated better and uh, move to a situation more similar to freedom. So there was a tremendous uh, tension about that. I mean, late, it was very late in the game that, uh, late in the game, I mean, it was late toward the Civil War that where numbers of uh, powerful political members of the slaveocracy realized that we were probably coming toward a civil war and that they better get in some industry and transportation going, right? And mm -hmm. they did use uh, uh, slave labor to do that, uh, but it was it was very late uh, in the operation uh, and it was on a quite limited scale. Overall, they rejected uh, even offers, I mean, People said, some people have argued that, well, why didn't the South like the Second Bank of the United States? Uh, it's exaggeration to say the South. I, so mm -hmm. I don't mean everybody in the South. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, 
you know, because the second bank was not investing, offering credit to people in the South. Well, that's not true. They did offer credit, uh, but it was often rejected because it was considered a foot in the door for probably the same way some states these days reject, you know, Medicaid funding from the federal government. It was considered a, a foot in the door for federal power mm -hmm. of people who had a vision of a different kind of country. Uh, in terms of the connection with the, the in the North, uh, I've never seen anything about the North being worried about competition in that in that regard. Uh, so uh, I can't say any more about that. Yeah. Rod? So rather than ask any esoteric questions about bonds, I'll simply make a comment that I found your talk brilliant. You know, I'm well familiar with American history, you know, PhD from the University of Chicago, et cetera, et cetera. And I really was unfamiliar with the writings of either Matthew or Henry Carey. And what I find especially brilliant was that a major anti-slavery argument in the 1850s could be made without the rhetoric and passion of both sides. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Are you the one with all the connections for speaking engagements? Maybe I, you, <laughs> we could get in touch. <laughs> we'll talk about the Cosmos Club. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but some of the Lincoln groups, but anyway. Uh, John Miller. Yes, well, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, uh, as a lot of you know, I'm also a docent at the Society of Cincinnati. We have a lot of uh, stuff about Hamilton. We have some papers that were donated just to us, the Hamilton papers, and study a lot about Hamilton. But this connection, the, like you were talking about, uh, Lincoln and Hamilton, I definitely had not run across before. In addition, um, I went to college in New Orleans and I, I, went, I went to one of my college reunions and I got this book, it was Lincoln in New Orleans. And they really do emphasize uh, about the uh, what he saw in the slave markets down there, uh, which somebody had also brought up. And the other thing was about the fact that when he was a young man, of course, uh, his father would sort of rent him out as a, a laborer, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then he would keep the money. And I think that had, a, I wonder what your take on that one was with his, his attitude towards slavery as well, because basically he felt his father was using him as a, a slave. Well, yeah, I, I knew you all knew about that, so that's why I didn't say anything. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, just again, a, a a shameless uh, promotion, but uh, the uh, I've been trying like mad to hear back my first book, the Hamil the Hamilton versus Wall Street. Um, you know, I I gave a copy to Andrew Outen at the at the society. He will not. He has not answered me. Uh, I, I well, I I know, I know Andrew. I can talk to him if you want. <laughs> I mean, the, the talk that I was thinking of doing, although you know was, although I can do many talks, was uh, Alexander Hamilton, father of our economic independence, you know, coming up on the 250th anniversary. Uh, but the, uh, which uh, I think would be, would be uh, something they have not done. I haven't seen, I mean, we watch a lot of their events on, on, uh, over the internet. I'm, I'm actually going to be there tomorrow. <laughs> They're, they're really, uh, I just wrote to him again yesterday after the event last <laughs> week, after the uh, lecture last week, which was really good. So on Lafayette. John can be your entree into that. Oh, I'm happy to talk to him. <laughs> um, anybody else have any, any other questions? I haven't put anything in the chat. Let me see. Do that. Yeah, we well, put put a, put your contact information in the chat. Meanwhile, I I will I'll just make a comment to end this. You know, we think about Lincoln. Um, most people today, I think, associate Lincoln with uh, the end of slavery, emancipation, and uh, the moral aspects of that. 
But Lincoln really, as you talk about, and other people have talked about, Lincoln was really more into e e economy issues well up into, into the early, at least 1850s. He didn't really talk that much about slavery before that. But you know, from what you've shown, um, slavery and economics are intertwined. You know, they're really the same thing, and especially in the South without Without slavery, they would lose basically most of the economy uh, because they hadn't invested in those things the North was investing in. So it really is, uh, it, it really is, you get the eco economy and slavery is really, really mixed in with each other and, and uh, codependent. I yeah, that, that's what my book is really dedicated to is the idea that you as I said at the beginning, that, you know, a moral approach to human beings requires a moral economy. And the closest thing we had, you can have criticisms of Hamilton's economy or whatever, or of him personally, but but uh, that was the that was the pathway to an alternative, you know, uh, and and it's tragic that and and the other aspect of it, which is in the book, and I, I really hope some of you will buy the book. Uh, is that we did have a strong anti-slavery movement in this country. It was not, you know, uh, a, it didn't just, it didn't start in Britain. It wasn't, uh, and it was ongoing, even in that period of 20 years where Hamiltonian economics was dropped. Uh, there was a coalition of abolition societies. They were very active. They were lobbying all the time. They were trying to move on the state level. They did succeed in certain uh, cutbacks of the slave trade and so forth. But it was not national, right? Because the national <laughs> government had abdicated on this question at, at, until 1808. So, uh, so there was a strong anti-slavery movement. Uh, but it needed the economics, and and I also take on very strongly the idea that that slavery built the country because we we were built despite the drain of slavery, uh, despite the cost, you know, not only moral cost but also economic cost. Real, I mean, how much? I mean, people who argue that the South was richer than the North because they could put money values on the enslaved people are are just uh, beyond the pale as far as I know. I'm concerned. Uh, the, that's not that's not wealth. That's not prosperity. Uh, and all you had to do was go down and take a tour through the southern states, as Frederick Olmsted did <laughs> in the 1850s, and you'd see, you know. This is not that you may have individuals who in money terms are the richest, you know, richer than anybody in Europe. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in terms of a, an economy, these people, uh, it, it was a joke. Uh, it's a, a horror show, actually. So, um, so that's my crusade. <laughs> Okay. So I, I want to, on behalf of everyone, you know, thank Nancy Spanos for coming and being our speaker tonight. It was an excellent, excellent talk. And this is this is the latest book, Defeating Slavery. The uh, earlier book she mentioned, Link, uh, Hamilton and Wall Street, is on my shelf over there. So if you can find it on that shelf, you can have it. Uh, I've read both. They're very, very good. Um, so thank you very much uh, for for your talk tonight. And, okay. uh, and I hope to meet you all in person sometime. I have joined the group, so. <laughs> good. And uh, yeah, we, hopefully we will, we will get some uh, in-person things going out. We'll work that out. The next, uh, the next meeting we have on our calendar is the one I mentioned earlier on, on June 19th at seven o'clock uh, Zoom meeting with John Grinspan from Smithsonian. He's gonna talk about his new book, Wide Awakes which is a, a really interesting, like Ed said, it's something that uh, a lot of people don't know about, but a very interesting part of the, the 1860 campaign. So it's your thank June you. Teenth, your Juneteenth meeting. Very yes. interesting, Ed. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's our Juneteenth meeting, exactly. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
we, we can bill it that way. So um, thank you all very much for being here. And thank you, for uh, thank, you, thank you all for supporting me for the last three years as president. And I, I know everybody will support Ed and I leave the good in, 